Governments have always tried to control the flow of information. No matter how transparent the people in power might tell us they want to be, there will always be things that we're not allowed to know. Government secrets are usually kept in the name of keeping you, the people, safe from harm. But for once we're not interested in what the government wants to keep secret, this time we want to know how it manages information that is in the public domain. Now under a dictatorship, controlling the flow of information is relatively easy. You're in control of the media, and the threat of serious consequences prevents most people from questioning your authority. In a democracy, it's a little harder, but here are just some of the things that our governments get up to. There's something different there. It looks like a face. It's a face. These days, a lot of governments employ the professionals when they need a bit of reputation cleansing. Bell Pottinger are probably the most notorious of the PR companies brought in to manage government reputations. They've represented the Sri Lankan government, which has been accused of carrying out war crimes against the Tamil population as its long-running civil war came to an end. They've also represented former Thai Premier Thaksin Sinawatra, who was ousted in a military coup amid corruption allegations. And then there's Alexander Lukashenko, known as Europe's last dictator, who amongst other things is accused of brutal repression of any political opposition and being fond of the occasional disappearance. Bell Pottinger have said that they simply work for people who want to tell their side of the story. And other PR companies are available to do similar things. But what about some of the subtler things that our governments do without employing those companies? New Labour in the UK knew the importance of PR, but under Tony Blair they brought the experts in-house. Alistair Campbell, who called himself the Prime Minister's official spokesman, was so good at political PR that he became known as the Sultan of Spin. Hello, nice to see you. Alongside people like Peter Mandelson, now Lord Mandelson, they came up with something called the grid system. They'd realised in opposition that they could plan media releases around the run-up to an election, in meticulous detail, months in advance. And when they were elected, they extended the system to work year-round. Now, most of it was pretty uncontroversial. It was designed to make sure that two government departments didn't make big announcements on the same day and risk them getting lost. But there was another more sinister application as well. The idea of having a good day to bury bad news isn't a new one, but the grid gave that idea a new level of organisation and planning. So if you have a major event that you know most of the nation will be talking about, you schedule the announcement of some bad news in the hope that nobody will notice. Sometimes, though, an event would happen that meant quickly rejigging the grid, like on September the 11th, 2001, when Joe Moore, a special advisor, sent an email saying it was now a very good day to get out anything that we want to bury. Now, systematically announcing the news on the dates you want it to be released is one thing, but if you really, really want to push your agenda, you have to create the news yourself. Operation Mockingbird was a CIA programme to control information in the media. At first, they created a network of journalists in the US who were recruited to present the CIA's message to the people. But that was later expanded to include foreign publications. This would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. Now we're looking at that very carefully. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Their MO was generally to plant anti-communist and pro-capitalist propaganda in the media, whether the journalists knew it was CIA or not. Their hope was that the international media and newswires would pick up on the story and repeat the lie, thus making it part of the mainstream narrative. What I do is important, yet no one will ever know. But an entire nation will be grateful. Don't just watch the news, live it. Now in part one of this series, we mentioned how Edward Bernays had orchestrated a campaign to overthrow Guatemala's President Arbenz. 
Well, that was done with the cooperation of Operation Mockingbird, who helped to spread the false accusation that Arbenz was a dangerous communist. And the CIA had its fingers in a lot of pies. It's thought that in the 1950s, there were around 3,000 people employed just on propaganda. And one of those pies was Hollywood. Frank Wisner, who was one of the operation's many heads, is thought to have arranged finance for the animated film version of George Orwell's Animal Farm. So gather here for wedding to sing our anthem and salute our flag. Now, taking Operation Mockingbird to its next logical step would be to produce video news for television networks. And though it's not part of Operation Mockingbird, it has been happening for a long time, with video news releases being provided to newsrooms by various US government departments. In 2004, it emerged that George W. Bush's government had been paying actors to pose as news reporters. The video news releases featured standing ovations for George Bush, praise of his Medicare laws, and even came with scripts for the news anchors. And they were broadcast by several states without the source of them ever being revealed. Basically, government propaganda being passed off as news. There's a TV studio in the White House that allows presidents to hold whistle-stop campaigns around the US or around the world if they wanted to, without all that time-consuming travelling. Presidents and other officials can connect to a local TV network, conduct an interview via satellite and move on to the next one, allowing them to spread their message far and wide in as little time as possible. Here's a clip of Barbara Bush doing just that, taken from Brian Springer's documentary, Spin. Remember that every single man, woman, and child in the state of South Carolina awakens to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. WIS, we hear us in Washington. I would remind people that every single morning we all awaken to a safer, freer world because of George Bush. WCBD, do you hear us in Washington? And Nicole, I would remind you and the people of Florence that all of us awaken every single day to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. Repeating the same line over and over again is one of the main ways that politicians get their message across. It's a simple principle, say something often enough and it will become part of the mainstream narrative. And the trust and faith that a lot of journalists put into what politicians say means that it doesn't take that long. And if there's a major idea that your politicians want you to get behind, like, say, the war on terror, then you can see it happening all too clearly. For the past seven years, Afghanistan and Iraq have been transformed from regimes that actively sponsored terror to democracies that fight terror. Libya has renounced its support for terror in its pursuit of nuclear weapons. Nations like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are actively pursuing the terrorists. Few nations, regimes like Syria and Iran continue to sponsor terror. As the 21st century unfolds, some may be tempted to assume that the threat has receded. This would be comforting. It would be wrong. 